I've spent a lot of time over the past two weeks focusing on that long Torah reading from our parasha, the Tochacha or the rebuke. It's uh, a reading from the Torah that I have laned multiple times, um, most memorably the first year I ever learned how to lane. I ended up laning that, that Aliyah um, at my, uh, my home synagogue, beside my home away from home. This is my home synagogue, but my home synagogue in Northern California, B'nai Israel Jewish Center. Um, learning the, this Torah reading again this year, I was surprised at how much of it I remembered. Um, the phrases in it really make an impact. So I've been thinking about this, this Aliyah in particular, and about the Torah reading in particular this week. And earlier this week, I received um, an email, one of the many emails I received from a certain rabbi's email list. And the subject line read, Rainbow Day this coming week, Bechukotai is about Shemitah. And I thought, what? Like, I don't understand either part of this email subject line. So my curiosity got the better of me. I clicked on it. And, and so this is what I learned. So Rainbow Day this coming week. If you, if you have never heard of Rainbow Day before, I think you are in very good company. Apparently, Rainbow Day is the day that the Rainbow Covenant was established. You learn something every year. Okay, so this day goes back to the book of Genesis. For, where, for those who um, joined me for our book of Genesis class these past six or so months, we learned the story of Noah and the flood. So chapter 8, verse 14 of the book of Genesis says, In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dry. So then this is setting the stage for Noah and his family and his animals to come out of the ark. So the first month on the Jewish calendar is the month of Nisan, the month where we celebrate Passover. The second month is this month, the month of Iyar. Today happens to be the 24th of Iyar. And the 27th day of the month of Iyar is Monday night into Tuesday. So that apparently is Rainbow Day, recognized and celebrated by, I think, at least a few people um, among the Jewish community. But so now we know. And so what is the rainbow covenant? This is actually from Genesis chapter 9, verse 13. God says to Noah, I have set my bow in the clouds, i.e. the rainbow, and it shall serve as a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. So this covenant is interesting because it's not with just with Jews. It's not even just with humans. It's between God and the whole earth. And Rabbi Arthur Waskow, who wrote this book called Seasons of Our Joy that I've read and studied many times, he teaches that the Torah gives us this specific date, the, the, the 27th day of the second month, so we can remember the devastation of the flood and celebrate the covenant made with all life that this is not something that's going to happen again. Okay, so that's Rainbow Day, and that's why it's important, according to Rabbi Arthur Waskow. But I was still wondering, how is this connected to the rest of the email subject line that Parashat Bechukotai, this week's parasha, is about Shemitah? So let's take a step back. What is Shemitah? So we'll think about last week's parasha, Bahar, and, and this, this idea that the, that parasha last week was about the principles of land tenure. And we learned, at least I learned, something new last week, that land tenure defines the relationship between a community and a society and the land uh, on which they live. Now, Shemitah is the sabbatical year. The idea is that when the Jewish people are living in the land of Israel, we have this, this principle, this practice, this commandment that every seventh year, we can't farm the land. The land has to rest. So I don't know very much about farming, but it seems to me very clear that that commandment is hard to follow. We just we use every year to grow food and to sustain the people, and in the seventh year, we can't farm. Taking one day a week off for Shabbat is hard enough. Taking a whole year off from farming the land, that's got to be very difficult. But so Rabbi David Seidenberg, who was the rabbi who sent this email in the first place, he teaches that Shemitah is the most important commandment, which I think is an interesting perspective. I've never heard anyone say before that Shemitah is the most important commandment. So he goes to this week's parasha, the selection that I've been thinking about, the tochacha, the rebuke. And he, he teaches that this, the end of the Tochacha explains the purpose of exile, explains the purpose of the Jewish people being exiled from our land. And this is in chapter 26, verses 32 through 35, in case anyone wants to follow along with their eyes in addition to their ears, chapter 26, verses 32 through 35. Verse 32 says, I will make the land desolate so that your enemies who settle in it will be appalled by it. And it continues, I will scatter you among the nations and I will unsheath the sword against you. 
Your land shall become a desolation and your cities a ruin. Then the land will make up for its Sabbath years throughout the time that it is desolate and you're in the land of your enemies. And then the land will rest and make up for its Sabbath years. Throughout the time it is desolate, the land will observe the rest that it did not observe in your Sabbath years while you were dwelling upon it. Fascinating. So two, two things that I personally noticed as I was learning this and I was studying it this week. One, in the laning, the, the trope and the word choice, this selection highlights itself. It's, it's a very, very dramatic trope and the, the word Shabbat and a lot of different variations of the word Shabbat are repeated. So these sentences definitely stand out. And, and also I was thinking that, you know, it, it's sort of like got this vibe of payback time, right? You know, if someone takes something from you that they don't deserve and you want to steal back from them, it's like, no, the land is going to come back and it's going to take back all that rest that you denied it, which is an interesting and, and powerful and troubling dynamic. So Rabbi David Seidenberg teaches us that we have to read this week's parasha, Bahukotai, in the context of last week's parasha, Bahar. Bahar is about Shemitah, this commandment that the land should rest every seventh year. And Bahukotai, this week's parasha, is about the consequences of not observing Shemitah. And what he says is, and this is a direct quote from him, what is at stake is the relationship between the people and the land. Now, for us Zionists, this is a fascinating and powerful concept. We sing in Hatikva Lihiot Am Chofshi Beretzenu, our, our dream that we have realized is to be a free nation on our land. So our land is an essential part of this dream. Rabbi Seidenberg also looks at the, the curses uh, proceeding in stages, and there are many rabbis that have different, different analyses of the, from the beginning to the end of the rebuke and how the curses go from bad to worse. And so he sees six stages that all have to do with the land and all have to do with the necessity of observing Shemitah. So the first stage of curse is that our enemies will eat our food. The second stage, the land will stop producing food. The third stage, the wild animals will start coming after us because they have nothing to eat. And I think that this is an interesting tie into that rainbow covenant where we have that God has made a promise for the whole earth and to not just to humans, but to animals, to the whole earth, to, to be a, a vibrant place to live. So when the wild animals chase us because they don't have any food, we gather together in our cities. We're not able to gather our grain together in a harvest, but our cities gather us together as we are afraid of these wild animals. And we'll, we'll eat, but we'll go hungry. That's the fourth stage. The fifth stage, which is definitely the worst for our modern ears, is that we will eat our children. And then the sixth stage, we will be lost among the nations, and the land of our enemies will eat us. So Rabbi David Seidenberg teaches that we are so used to exile that this final curse, which is intended by the Torah to be the worst curse, doesn't seem like the worst. We love our children. We don't want to think about anything bad happening to our children. But symbolically, if the land eats us, that represents the final step in a complete breakdown of the relationship between us and our land. It's a complete reversal of the right relationship between uh, us and our land, that the land will nourish us, and instead in this curse, the land will devour us. Now also in this parasha, which uh, Jonathan Marcus read for us so beautifully, there are blessings. And the blessings illustrate what the land should look like. They illustrate what should be happening. The earth and the trees will yield produce and fruit, will eat our fill and dwell securely. There will be no vicious beasts, no swords. Instead, there'll be shalom ba'aretz, peace in the land. Rabbi David Seidenberg argues that Shemitah is what makes this possible. He says that all our commandments support the creation and functioning of a society that can observe Shemitah. He even says Shabbat, taking a day off one out of every of seven days off, that prepares us for Shemitah, taking one year out of every seven years off from farming. And this, I think, is the most beautiful, in my reading, blessing that, that God gives to us. And God says, when we're, when we're following the commandments, when everything is going the way it should, God will walk among us. God will be our God, and we will be God's nation. So there are three intertwined relationships. There's God, there's the people of Israel, and there's Haaretz, our land. These relationships are intertwined. 
when with his means for us as Zionists, we know we need the land of Israel so we can be the people of Israel. So what do we do with all this wonderful scholarship? Now, Rabbi David Seidenberg does not have a pat answer. We have this idea of Rainbow Day, that God has a covenant with the earth, humans, land, and all the creatures. And we have this idea that God has a special plan for us, the Jewish people, that we are God's people, and that we dwell in our land, and every seventh year we let our land rest. So how do we do this? We're not really an agricultural society completely anymore. This year, I'm seeing our task is to figure this out. We still do grow food throughout the world and definitely in the land of Israel. We've got grapes, grain, avocados, cucumbers, cherry tomatoes. I know that some of us in this community have harvested those foods from our holy land this year going to volunteer. And how do we do all this while we observe Shemitah? And I think the bigger question for us, those of us who live outside the land of Israel or even those of us who live inside the land of Israel and work in high tech or tourism or some industry that is not agriculture, we've got to figure out how to live by these commandments and create and contribute to a society that can observe Shemitah. This is a little bit abstract and I think that now we're getting into the realm of belief. We believe the Torah gives us guidance on how to navigate life. And part of how we know this is true is because the Torah connects us to our nation's land, the land of Israel. It's our responsibility to find a way to live by the commandments in a way that allows the Jewish people to be in relationship with our land, the land of Israel. We'll know we're doing it right when the earth and the trees yield produce, when we're able to eat our fill and dwell securely, there will be no swords or vicious beasts, and we will have shalom ba'aretz. It would be great if we had the answer to these questions today. But we're doing the next best thing. We're here together, and we're working to figure it out. So for the moment, may we have enough patience with our current reality to not completely lose our minds, and may we have the strength and the endurance to make positive change. And for the future, may we continue to have faith in our land, that we might live in the land of Israel and have abundance, security, and peace. Shabbat Shalom.